Hey, peace and blessings to you. My name is Jerry B. I am the Entree Musician, and so are you. And so is this wonderful gentleman we are about to introduce. But I got to tell you, you know, there are podcast episodes and then there are podcast episodes. This is going to be the latter because you've heard the names before. I mean, you know, the famous names, right? The drummer, Steve Gadd, you know, Billy Cobham, Dave Weckl, and on. But there are people who are burning under the radar that you may not know, but who have contributed to the soundtrack of your life. This brother here, Robbie Amin, Grammy award-winning drummer and composer. He's co-authored a method book with the legendary bassist Lincoln Goins. I'm telling you, this book, Funkifying the Clave, should be in your collection. He has three albums as a leader, but listen, hundreds hundreds of recordings, including Dizzy Gillespie, Ruben Blades, Paul Simon, Dave Valentine, Eddie Paul Mary, Carly Simon, Mongo Santa Maria, Jack Bruce, just to name a few, okay? Not to mention a session musician with numerous jingles, film scores, and TV music, including the HBO series Sex in the City. This is Robbie Amin. Brother man, blessings to you, bro. Thanks for having me, brother. Yeah, man. I really appreciate it, man. I'm looking forward to doing this. Absolutely. I appreciate you. And I, I we were talking right before the camera started rolling, man. We're talking about a young 19-year-old brother who's <laughs> loving Dave Valentine, right? Gets the album, GRP album, live at the Blue Note and changes my trajectory of what's happening with you and Lincoln on the bass. And like you said, Gia, Giovanni on the uh, Kungas. And this was like the trifecta of Latin jazz <laughs> funk. And you guys were burning. And it made me go back in and try to check you out. That was the first time I heard of you, man. Beautiful, man. Yeah, I mean, well, what we what we're just chatting about, as I was saying, like, because I've done uh, numerous live records at the Blue Note over the years. So they actually had their own record label for a while. Um, and you would do a week at the club and then they'd record the last couple nights. But back then, with the, with that record for GRP, when you had the remote studios that, that, that took up a whole block, you know, like the big, the big truck parked out front literally took up the whole block. That was, to me, one of the best sounding uh, live records I'd done. And what I was getting ready, to, I was talking about is that GRP Records at the time, well, it was... Um, it was Larry Rosen and Dave right. Grusin. And and Larry, Larry Rosen's Rosen. a drummer. He's a drummer. Exactly. He, yeah, they yeah, actually, yeah. they were playing on the, I mean, the Andy Williams show. That's when, because <laughs> Dave Grusin was a music director and, and, and Larry Rosen was a drummer. But what Larry Rosen turned into, aside from being a formidable businessman, he was a, a sound engineer. And he he engineered all the the, the first, you know, I don't know, first 10 years or five, 10 years of GRP records. And the the first record that I did with Dave Valentine was the last record that Larry Rosen recorded as an engineer, wow. because then he got into like, he you know, the uh, the demands of running the label and so forth. He got more into the bit. But man, and I mean, we're talking about that was probably 1984, you know, mm -hmm. and what are we now? 2023. To this day, that's the best drum sound I ever got. Wow. And we I remember we recorded at AR, which was the old AR, which was where like that was a legendary place, Steely Dan, Sinatra with the Quincy Jones Orchestra, that record. I mean, that oh that was God. a magical room. I recorded Dizzy Gillespie there. But this record to this day, man, is just wow. the sound. And you know, I mean, you know, everybody's got their their, their gear now and then you know, digitizing, you know, you can do anything in my little basement here. But to me, man, that's to to the, my first rec, one of my first records ended up being the best drum sound I ever had, man. But, you know, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's excellent, man. That that's excellent, and that that was a killer smoker. I mean, I could put that on today and still vibe on it. You know, the the musical selection, the band was as tight as a glove, man. It was just like right on point. The vibe was right there, and God bless the memory of Dave Valentine, man. Yeah, but, man. Uh, you know, quite a yeah. loss. You know, how yep. did you first meet him? Because we, I, I, I'm gonna just e explode you with questions, man. Because there's a lot of stuff to ask you because of the amount of recordings that you've done. But how did you meet Dave uh, Valentine? How was that set up? Well, I actually met him um, 
I had I had met Lincoln Goins, the bass player you're talking about. They were, I remember, uh, I mean, I grew up listening to Dave Allen. I used to go to Club Mikel's. He used to play there when I, I would be like in junior high school. I'd come in. I lived, grew up in New Haven by hour and change outside of New York. So I'd come to New York all the time. And so I remember I was, I had moved to New York. I was starting to work. And I went to 7th Avenue South, which was the Brecker Brothers Club at the time. Oh, my and Dave gosh. Was yeah. There. yeah. And I went up to Lincoln, just, you know, just out of the blue. I said, yo, you know, I, lo I love the way you, obviously, I love the way you play. And I, you want to get together sometime. So we started hanging out and shedding in my my five floor walk up as a drummer in New York, which nobody could figure that one out. I said, man, you <laughs> chose a five floor. But we used to play hours and hours and hours a day. And then we started a band. Uh, it was called uh, Future Paradise mm. uh, because we had an arrangement of Pastime Paradise with Stevie Toon. Uh, gotcha. And it was like Latin jazz funk. And uh, it was a good band, man. Robin Eubanks was playing trombone oh. and a whole bunch of guys. And so we just started gigging around town. And Dave Valentine, obviously Lincoln was, had been working with him for years before. He invited Dave to a, to a hit. And Dave said, I'm going to call you. I'm going to do a new record. I'm going to call you. And I was like, yeah, right. And he called me. So, you know, <laughs> then that's how I got hooked up with Dave Valentine through Lincoln, actually. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So let's just go back further than that. Like in your formative years, when did you know? Um, because I don't know if you just decided one day you were going to set the world on fire with drums or it was something else that you were interested in or drums came along. What happened? I started, I guess I started playing relatively young. I mean, there are people that started playing younger than me. You know, you, you got, got people like two or three years old. I'd say I was more like nine, you know what I mean? And, and I just started playing on some, you know, like a lot of people, just some homemade drums. You know, like I, I had a, I remember I went to this elementary school. We were studying, it was pretty progressive for that, those days. And we were studying Native Americans. And wow. one of the projects, make a drum. So I got an inner tube out of a tire, stretch it over like coffee cans and stuff like that. And, 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 uh, started playing, you know, and then just, yeah, then I, that was just like my, my, and in that, at that same school, mm -hmm. bro, I think I was in like fourth, fifth, fifth grade, mm -hmm. the teacher laid on, laid, he, he, he said, you should check this out because back then you listen to what was on the radio and what was on the radio when I grew up was, you know, it was either the Temptations or the Beatles, you know, right. and, and and everything in between. So I was listening to that. Well, this guy turns me on to John Coltrane, Africa Brass. Ooh. And and it was in, in a Miles record, but the Africa, and I, I didn't know, I mean, I was like 10 years old and I put it on, man. And I was like, I kind of like, it, you know, it, it blew my mind. I didn't know, I, I didn't make heads or tails, but I, I knew I loved it, but I didn't understand what was going on. But that's kind of what set me into the, you know, jazz zone. You know, I mean, that that at a, at a relatively young age. So that that was really like, I look at that as a kind of a, a a major turning point, like a yeah, one of those, you know, revelation moments. Exactly. And, uh, and then you know, so then that's kind of like what. Then I just started. I played a lot of my own. I had like this local guy. Then I I had the good fortune. I studied with um the great Ed Blackwell. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, when at Coleman's drummer, Eric Dolphy's drummer, because he was uh, he was living in Middletown, Connecticut, because he was actually teaching at Wesleyan University because he had had a liver uh, liver kidney problems. So he wasn't gotcha. able to go on the road, mm -hmm. and so I just called him up, man, and said, you know, would, could I come and meet with you? You know, I heard you're giving lessons, and I so I got to study with him, which that was a really like you know, I'm still figuring out stuff that he showed me. You know. My God. And so what, what uh, age were you when you put your first band together? I mean, when you realized, hey, this Coltrane thing is happening, I'm studying now, uh, this is going to be my profession. You know, that's 10, 11, 13? Yeah, I mean, I guess I started playing locally probably by the time I was like 14, 15. You know, I started just playing in New Haven um, and different bands, some some... You know, some funk bands, some straight ahead bands, some uh, I go to jam sessions, you know, just anything just to, to get, you know, play as much as I could. And then I so there was a uh, not as big as there is now, but there was a sizable um, Puerto Rican community in New Haven at the time. So there was some salsa band. And that was another thing that always, you know, grabbed my attention. 
you know, Latin music. So I was digging that too. And I was just trying to figure out, hey, how do I incorporate this on the drum set? And basically I was just doing it by ear, like not having people show me, you know, conga technique or timbala technique, just trying to, so I was trying to capture the sound, what I was hearing, the rhythms, but I wasn't necessarily executing them correctly. But sometimes that doesn't really matter if you play in the rhythm right, you know what I mean? So so that, that kind of like, you know, that, that was something I was growing up listening to too. Well, when was your first recording session? Um, probably some stuff in New Haven, you know, locally. There was I, I was there was this band. It was kind of like a Earth, Wind, and Fire was really big then. So, you know, I think we we tried we tried we did some kind of demo. I was playing a rock band then too, but nothing like the, you know like serious. Like it wasn't until I moved to New York that I you know I really started recording like. I mean, I like to call them real records, but you know. Yeah. But yeah, you know. Well, who was the first real cat that said, "Okay, you come on in"? Uh, well, I guess time. in a way it was Valentine. When I first, when I first in New York, I was playing with a bebop band on the street. I was, I was playing. Um, uh, spent the summer doing that. It was five per five people band. We were, we were out there, and and I, I met people that way. Uh, this, uh, another, uh, another flute player. In fact, this was before I met Dave Valentine. Uh, also, he's going on to the other side. His name was Mauricio Smith, Panamanian flute saxophonist, who was the original sax player on Saturday Night Live. He was in the original oh, Saturday Night Live, band. and and he was he was a session guy. Um, and he sent me to Mexico. Uh, I was playing on the street, and he came up. He said, "Hey, kid, you got eyes to go to Mexico?" I used to go to Mexico. I said, because he was old school, you know, with that. <laughs> you got eyes to go to Mexico. I said, yeah, I got eyes to go. So I went there for like three or four months. And when I came back, he started calling me the jingles, you know, like, oh. and and that kind of, so I'm sort of doing studio work, but then I realized I'm not really playing out there, like on the scene in New York. So that's when I hit Lincoln up and we try to put this band together. So, so I had done a, f a few records with Mauricio and some commercials and, but probably the first record that kind of, made some noise was was with Dave Valentine, or the Kalahari record. That, that, that was the first, yeah. And then, you know, just things led to another. I was I was blessed to have a, a relationship with the people at GRP who treated me beautifully. You know, Dave Grusin and he would call me for stuff. Sometimes he called me for film scores and all that. And so, you know, that that it was to me that was a but the, the cat to me the really would I would say it was Mauricio Smith, you know, and that was just mm -hmm. all playing on the street. So, I mean, that's why I tell people, man, like, if you know, a lot of people have you want to have a plan if you're trying to break into the business, and it, things are completely different now. We know that I mean, you got the home studios, you got you know, but but back then you either you had to move to New York or LA, LA you know, right. I'm talking about like the 80s, um, yeah. and so. So people would say, well, do you have to have a gig lined up? And you have to, you know, well, how do you just move? And I couldn't say anything because when they said, well, what did you do? I said, I was playing on the street. So I'm not one to say, no, you got to have a serious gig hooked up before you can move. Because, well, what did you do? Well, play on the street. But but the street was the, it was kind of like, there were some bad bad dudes playing on, you know, and, and that's just literally, that's New York City, man. Guy yeah. comes up, you want to go to Mexico? Boom, bingo. Okay, I'm doing a Budweiser commercial. Can you make, you know, it's like, Bam, wow. you know so you know wow. so are you reading at this point or just going by ear or what what are you doing with the music i mean are no i studied it? i yeah I, I you know i was i read you know like I, I studied um yeah i guess i always sort of read once i started taking lessons um you know like formal lessons yeah i mean i got i was i was reading and and like when i said i started out just playing i'm by ear, that would have been. But by the time I was a teenager, I was, you know, I was going through all the books and, you know, yeah. and <clears throat> whatnot. Right. Yeah. Now, let's go back to the jingles for a second, Dan. With <laughs> respect to those, uh, what were you learning about the business apart from music as you're coming in as a session player? Were there some things that you needed to be like right up on or, you know, you're not going to get called back or what, what were those things? Because well, drummers out here actually, need to know that. That's a yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, you know, and it ties into reading. I mean, the only the only reason somebody you need to know how to read, uh, one of the only reasons is this the time saver. And when you get booked for a jingle, 
get an hour. And you do different versions. You do a 30 second, you do a 60 second, you do a shorter version, you do a version for TV, re- version for radio. So you were basically sight reading. Like you might run it once and boom, they're recording. So if you couldn't read well, you know, you held up the date, no matter how well you played. So that was important. And the other thing that was important was um, whatever style required of, of you, you had to play it like that's what you grew up playing. Yeah. I mean, if, if it was a country and Western version of whatever, you had to play that like you just grew up. That's what you and 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 not that you necessarily grew up playing that, but that you love playing it because and you find it was like Duke Ellington said, man, there's good and bad music. We all have our preferences, but every music has a certain amount of joy, emotion, a certain amount of beauty, in my right. opinion. You know, yes. and if you get inside that, and it doesn't matter what instrument you play, for us, for drummers, it's the groove, you know, and and what what how do you make like there's a, a country and western is a completely different type of a groove than well, I don't even think country and western exists anymore, but but, but it did <laughs> from then say At like what time? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, you know hip hop, country and western, yes. heavy metal, everything's got its, you know. So that was another lesson is to play, to be like the session cats. And I was like, man, I was like in my, you know, I was awestruck because some of the guys in these dates were people that I were like, were my heroes as, as a, as a kid, you know, bass player, Francisco Centeno or, you know, or Sal Cuevas or, or, or whoever, you know, and I'm like, wow, man, playing with these. So of course I'm nervous. Like, you know, you know, the word And, 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 you know, but sometimes you get thrown in, you don't have time to like, you know, that's what happened with Dizzy. When I put, recorded one first record I recorded with Dizzy Gillespie, I didn't have time to get nervous. Mm. They called me up, they said, you want to come down to the studio? They got somebody recording with Dizzy. The drummer's not working out. Can you come down, come early, meet Dizzy, and um, see if, you know, and then we'll start. Re- Man, I didn't even have time to like think of like, Dizzy, what? You know, I just went down and did it. So those are yeah. some of the tools, you know, like be ready, know how to read and know how to get inside the style, you know, mm-hmm. and, and and don't be, um, you know, don't be like uh, uh, arrogant about it. Uh, yeah. Anybody can play that. Uh-uh. I mean, right. Look, I'm, I just turned 63 two mm-hmm. days ago. Right. Bro. You know what I'm, I'm you know, what I'm listening to now and I'm getting into more than. I mean, believe it or not, like skateboard punk, mm. like the music that they be playing, like in 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 Fullerton, you know, Long Beach in California, like wow. in the in the nineties. Because, and I used to think, you know, I mean, I'm basically a jazz musician, yeah. you know. What am I yeah. doing? And I'm checking, and I used to think, oh, that's you got 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 got. Yeah, I said, man, that's like polka music, you know. Uh-huh, actually, right? not <laughs> actually not. Yeah, I mean, it is and it isn't. And I'm checking yeah. out these. And I'm saying, man, wow. You know, how come I never got so I'm out down here shedding to like these bit, you know. So I'm saying it's like you gotta check your like that's what it was Quincy Jones said, you know, check your ego at the you got you can't you gotta go in, that's what I mean, like you live and breathe whatever they're asking you to do, you Absolutely. know, because you'll find you'll find the the beauty in it, you know. I believe mm-hmm. so. Mm-hmm. Well, you you prompt two questions uh, with regard to that. Number one is, is there a particular style of music that to date you have not played? Um, Well, I mean, I've never gotten calls to do a, a skateboard, skate punk record, you know. Um, I mean, you know, I don't know, like death metal, maybe, you know, like, you know, I mean, I, I got it too. And one of my records is kind of like a metal type thing. Um, and, but that, yeah, that's the thing, man, every day, you know, you get known for things that you are known for, you know, yeah. so you get, but I've always tried to like be versatile enough that cats will call me for not necessarily in the Afro-Cuban zone gotcha. or in the jazz zone or, in, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and, and because to me, especially as a rhythm section player, like if I, if I, if I was a sax player, I could see the limitations of certain pop music because harmonically it's, it's just not as sophisticated and you get to blow a 16 bar solo 
you know, every like five tunes. I mean, it, it can't be as fun. Right. You know, I mean, you're playing in a band like Tower of Power, Earth, when it, for sure, you know, yeah. you're playing or, or a salsa band. You're getting to play all night long. Correct. But as a drummer, rhythm section man, I have just as, I'll be honest, I, I'll have just as much fun playing timba, you know, mm. uh, salsa or, or you know, R&B as playing, you know, hard bop. No judgment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. To me, it's all just like, you know. Absolutely. Well, tell second question to that would be then as a session player and uh, in working with so many named artists as you have, you know, Dizzy Gillespie's personality is different from Carly Simon's and Jack Bruce and whatnot. How are you navigating uh, the expectations based on their personality and how they want to hear the music as a side man? Well, I think there's a couple things. I mean, I, like I say, you know, it kind of goes without saying. You go in with an open mind. You you really you're trying to make them happy, you know. Um, but you still want to, you know. You you there's a reason they called you. So you you know you want to also, I, your personality has to sort of come out, you know, without necessarily forcing it or overplaying. And the other thing is, you know, um, I have to say, I think I've been really lucky. Most of the people that I played with, I, man, everybody has been is just kind of really beautiful people as mm -hmm. people. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying we, everybody's going to have their, you know, rough moments. Oh, You're going to sure. work with somebody. But in general, man, they, I, can, I can't. It's hard for me to remember people that I work with that were like, you know, I don't know what the, if there's like a censorship yeah. on this show. Yeah, yeah. But like, uh, a real we'll, we'll keep it family friendly. Yeah. Oh, right. right. Oh, you know. What I'm <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I can say words. <laughs> Not really. You know what I'm saying? It's like, um, I, I, I really find like, cause it, you know, playing music, man, is is you know, you're lucky to be able to do something, play music, and I say this, man, you know. If you're making a living playing music, and I don't care where, or what you know, you don't have to be like, you know, touring with 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 you know huge band or or playing in the Philharmonic. Or, I mean, if if you're playing on weekends or you're doing wherever, you know, I mean, that's a that's a joy, a blessing. And I Absolutely. think that most people in this industry are, you know. They're like beautiful people, man. You know, they, they you know, usually, the, you know, they're funny. They got lots of stories. They've lived a lot of things that, you know, and whether they're the, the, so the, 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 the artist, it's the, 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 if it's the lead singer or if it's just yeah. the bass player, I don't mean just the, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't sure, have anything no. to do with like, the hierarchy of it, you know, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think so in that sense. Um, yeah. I think it, it's, it's kind of easy to get along with with the, with you know because go ahead what's what's the most challenging gig and you don't have to name the artist but what's the most challenging gig that you think you've played to date for a variety of reasons whether it was the person's check your ego at the door they brought their ego with them or the situation was just real weird do you remember is there one that stands out like <sighs> grateful that's over not not really one in particular. I mean, sometimes some of the things that have been challenging have been also just um, certain people. I mean, that that have have written very complicated music mm. and are very married to what they've written and don't let you really breathe so much. Like that thing about putting yourself into it. Uh, yeah. let, and sometimes I, there's that situation where I'm like, you know, if you really anything you do, it's like, no, don't do that. Do I this do this do. and then it's kind of like well man you know and it's happened to me the older I get I'm kind of like oh, right. man, why'd you call me you know what I mean it's like you know and and then on the other hand you know like like I mean I, I can say like Paul Simon is mm -hmm. like, like unbelievable like a because Paul Simon to me I worked with him for several years it was like oftentimes he really 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 knew what he did not want but he didn't know what he wanted. So the process, so he would eliminate, no, 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 you know what I mean? And so yeah. forth and so on. And and you talk to Paul Simon, and to me, Paul Simon, as far as aside from his, you know, being a master uh, uh, songwriter, songwriter, I can't, 
you know, I can't separate him that I'm working with Paul Simon from the fact that his guy was one of my heroes my whole life was Steve Gadd. So it's like I got that and I got Paul Simon at the same time. And I'm just thinking like, man, you know, what does he want? What And and he would, you know, there, I could push back. Like if I didn't think something could work, once somebody trusts you, you could yeah. sort of say, yeah, I'll try that. But I don't know. And and, and most people, you know, they're not going to say, no, 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 no. You don't say I tell you know what I mean? Yeah, you don't right, get right. to that. You know what I mean? So, but that was challenging in a different way because it's just challenging to to have the patience that that he had and to let the let the person indulge. Like you know, okay, this might sound crazy, but just try this. You know what I mean? And right. then do it, and not just say you know, no, no, man. But, you know, but uh, yeah. So challenges in that way, nothing in particular really stands out. You know, I don't, not particularly. Gotcha. So with respect to uh, Steve Gatt being a hero, uh, you have some other heroes or are there any current drummers that you're listening to and going? Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, I'm always I mean, it's kind of if I had to put two drummers, if I had to distill. And, it, and it's kind of funny because it's Elvin Jones and Steve Gadd. Oh, my. And and I actually I, I to some people that sounds almost like really disparate but not really you know uh not to me i mean you know elvin was like i said when i heard the cold train record that you know um i mean you know you could talk about tony williams you could talk about me oh, but to me elvin just hit me in a, in a way you know yeah and gad and 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 gad you know partly also because here's a guy that the same with elvin you hear four bars you hear the ride symbol you know who it is you know, what I'm saying? and mm -hmm. and gag to play two and four on the snare, one and three on the kick, and eighth notes on the hi hat, and you know it's him. You know how is that possible? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, it yeah. is like, and but then above and beyond them, then I got to name like two hundred people. <laughs> you know, what I'm I mean, you know, like you know, I mean, a huge influence was was uh, Yogi Horton. Mm, uh, he's I the remember Yogi. Drummer. Yeah, Luther Who Vandross. Yeah. Luther Vandross, you know, Ashford and Simpson. Uh, yeah. I got to hang out with them when I first moved to, to, before I actually was living in New York. And I used to watch some of these sessions because my very good friend, he was like an older brother to me, was the uh, session percussionist, Sammy Figueroa, uh, who's been on all those dates, a lot of them. Yeah. So he would bring me to this. I sometimes go watch these guys record. And I got to hear, like, you know, Yogi with, 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 Marcus Miller Marcus, and Doc yeah. Powell and guitar, you know, creating these grooves. You had five of the funkiest right. cats on the planet feeding off each other. So, exactly. And it would be like the meters who I had. The, I had the, the great, uh, I worked with Leo Nocentelli for years, also the meters, you know, but that's another kind of like, you know, where you, how are you going to argue with, four, I mean, one guy can be a genius. He can come up with a bass line, a pink keyboard, and that's, be, but there's like only two or three to me like that. It's like Stevie Wonder. Right. Prince, you know right. what I'm saying? But you get four or five people on that level together? Come on. You know what I mean? So <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, Yogi was a big and and to the, to the to current players, I mean he just he just passed, man. And I and I never met him. He was a huge influence was Aaron Spears. Yeah. You know, I mean there's a whole gospel scene and the cats that are playing and, and the but to me he was on another he was like the elven of that. You yeah. know what I mean? I mean, there's so Absolutely. many great, great players, man. I mean, out there now. Unfortunately, the music that's being consumed, I can't yeah. say a lot of it is great. But individual players. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a whole nother that, that will have that's to be a whole other that's a whole other right there, man. Because <laughs> you know, I mean we, we talk about that all the time and because of age, you know, I'm I'm turning fifty nine in a couple of months here and uh you know the thing is you know, you give me and you say to me, this is juice right here. But you I was fed on Chikoria, Herbie Hancock, you know, right. this. Right. OK, it's good. I mean, it's good. I You know, that's no disrespect and I'm not being right. insensitive to it. But you can't give a kid at eight years old Miles Davis, you know, or Coltrane right. and then now right. go, this is juice. OK, it is. It does have its space, but. 
don't do that to me. Because then no, I, I sound mean, like an elitist. And I'm not trying to be. I'm trying to be no, appreciative. No, it's true. Of the art, it's but, true. You know. And I agree. And and also, even if you're like, we're not even, because my love is jazz. But yeah. we're, we're talking now like sort of pop. And it's funny, like an hour ago, I was on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And they have this thing that shows up, Casey Kasem, where he would list the 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 the, the, Top, the, the yeah. number number one song of each month for a year, right? So I'm just checking it out, you know, and that sometimes it shows up on the TikTok. And Casey Kasem, because I'm a Lebanese, I'm Lebanese Druze, and he was Lebanese Druze too, which is kind of funny. But anyway, yeah. So I was like, this was 1972. 1972, it was um it was uh Al Green, let's be together. It was uh, um, uh, uh, American Pie. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. Papa was a Rolling Stone. It was Roberta Flack. First time ever I, I saw your face. Wow. It was um, I'm 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 forget. I mean, but I'm saying, man, are you kidding me? That was just one year. It, it was you know I can see clearly now. I'm yeah, like, I'm like, man, I'm sorry. Maybe you get one song a year yeah. <laughs> like that. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, that's a year, like sometimes, that, and that's being very generous. I that is exactly. being generous. I'm not, exactly, exactly. <laughs> again, exactly. the the whole thing is when you when you when you when February comes around and they say who the Grammy winners are by, uh, let me just say as an aside, God bless you because you are a Grammy winner. But listen, I think they're handing them out like candy now. Because again, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. just saying, you know, you had eight Grammys, but but the Constitution and the foundation of the music that you're presenting, when we would go back to 72, 73, 74, you know, I right. mean, Stevie Wonder and just, I mean, right. come on. And it's just like, just, you know, yeah, um, I mean, um, I mean, Frankie yeah. Beverly has no Grammy. Right. Okay. Right. Come on. Right. Give me right. a break. Anyway. Right. Right. Back yeah, to but that's the conversation. I guess. Right, right. We already got into that other podcast already, right? <laughs> yeah, you know. Interestingly, but I wanted to ask because you had said something lean on about, me, lean on me, lean on me oh, with Bill another one. Gee, I mean, I'm telling you, all that was one year, man. <laughs> what we what you? We sound like grumpy old men now, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, it's true, but. But 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 I'm talking about I'm celebrating how beautiful that music is. Absolutely. Like I'm not throwing stones. Today, throwing things today right. you can put it on and it still rocks. Exactly. Today. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing stuff. Okay. Here's a question <laughs> because <laughs> what, what you know we were talking about just challenging gigs and whatnot and you you didn't speak of the group but there's a group and I'll, I'll just name them of course uh, Steely Dan <laughs> who. Jeff Picaro and other drummers have said, wow, you know, as far as them in auditions, putting themselves into the groove, it would never happen. Uh, did you have an opportunity to audition for Steely, Steely Dan? Were you ever called in? No, and... no. Okay. Actually, no, I never did. I never did. I mean, I, I, yeah, I love it. Lo I mean, love their love stuff. Them. Absolutely. Yeah, but yeah, I, but I remember no, no, interviewing. I didn't know they, I know they had, I mean, they, when they started playing live, I have, I have a lot of friends that played with them. I know like John Beasley, he, I think he was in that one of the first, I mean, I'm talking about early, early, but I think he was in the band when I think Peter Erskine did it. Then Dennis Chambers did it. Um, uh, Ricky and, Lawson they, did one. Hit Ricky one. Lawson did it. And, and as a matter of fact, I think Ricky, I think my friend John Beasley did it when Ricky Lawson was playing, but um, the guy that's been doing it steady for the last maybe Eight or nine years, maybe even ten. We actually shared a studio space for many years. I had a, a studio. A friend of mine ran a studio space. Was Keith Carlock? Oh yeah, and, Keith. And we had a we had a room. He was be shedding back then all the time. Um, there was a room. It was like seven or eight of us. It was it was um, um, it was Keith Carlock. It was Marvin Smitty Smith. It was Anton Fig because the oh, studio wow, was yeah. below the Ed Sullivan Building where they do the uh, Letterman show. Um, and that was a pretty hot room, man, because we had all, the, all those guys, you know, it was yeah. a friend of mine, Robbie Gonzalez, the drummer had it. But uh, but to me, Keith kind of owns that that chair, man. He's sure. Like, just, well, he's got that. He's got that on lockdown, man. I mean, that pocket is just straight. He's got the purdy shuffle. He's got he's got everything that's needed, you know, to make it happen, you know, exactly. <laughs> without fail. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 
By the way, before we begin talking about the book, you were talking about who you listen to. And, you know, I'm not just saying this because you're sitting here, but I wanted to go on record. First and foremost, Brother Robbie, my nose is brown enough. I don't have to kiss butt. I don't have to say anything I don't mean. Okay. But you and William Kennedy, if I can make a composite of the two of you, that would be, that's the type of drummer I'm trying to be when I grow up. Uh, you know who William Kennedy is, of course. Of course. And just yeah, both of you own the pocket. You surprise us. You have fire and electricity, but you never, ever let go of the groove, ever. And I just love you for it. So I just got to say Thank you, bro. I mean, I think, I really think part of that is, <clears throat> and I think the two drummers that were, that I considered, like if I had to name the two drum gods for me, are drummers like that. I mean, Elvin, no matter how complex he would go in his, in his solos, those rolling triplets, the f that you just kept, you felt, and Gad is another guy. Gad, you can groove to any solo he does, you know? And that's the thing I like about Aaron Spears, because Aaron Spears would, he'd do like fills that were like, like, man, what was that? But you still feel like he's even working the backbeat into the fill. It's like, you don't, because, you know, I, I, I mean, I think part of it, if you come out of the gospel tradition, yeah. you, the choir needs to hear the backbeat. Correct. And these guys were getting into like guys like Vinny and, and Dennis Chambers and Weckle. And they said, but they, but they can't lose the pocket because then what are they, you know, I mean, I didn't grow up in a church tradition at all, yeah. but I understand that that. So I, I, I feel like drummers like that. I mean, Steve Jordan, that's another guy for mm. me. Always oh. been like a huge, huge, yeah. you know, and I go back to when he was kind of a fusion cat when he's playing with like yes. John Schofield and, and, you know, you know, these guys, you know, but um, yeah, that's another one, man. I mean, there's just so many of it. It's almost not fair to just name a few, but you know. Yeah, because somebody's you know. going to get left out and, they, and they've really contributed to Definitely. the music, you know, in a, in a huge, huge way. I just, you know, again, <laughs> when I started, you know, I was talking about those that Dave Weckl, I mean, oh my God, you know, but they're, they're names that come forth, but not too many people talk about William Kennedy or Rob right. Yameen. Right. Even though you guys have been in the undercurrent of everything that's really been happening for decades. So, you know, I want you to know that when I listen, and again, live at the Blue Note, right. from beginning to end, it's like, I've got to get that. <laughs> you know, and I'm, on the CD player, yeah, let me get it. that. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. bless I mean, you for that. To me, to me, one of the things about this business is your dream my dream was to get on a record man you know i mean the idea of i'm gonna move to new york and my dream is man it, it can can i get on a if somebody gonna call me to get on and then i once you do that then you realize what you really got to worry about is getting on another record <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, an <laughs> and another and that and that's the thing you know <laughs> bro because it's like if you're you're doing this man 10 years, 20, 30, 40, 50. And then I see people like, you know, I mean, Jackie Jeanette, you know, Roy Ains, you know, I mean, and 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 the reason that those guys are still out there, you know, God forbid you have like a, a drumming, you know, anything can happen, man. You can break your arm, you know what I'm saying? But assuming that you got your four limbs intact, and why are those guys? Because they're always learning, man. Yeah. They don't sound, they, they could have coasted at any point in their career and they would still be household names. But they all, you know, I'll just tell you an anecdote. There was a, I, I teach one day a week at Rutgers uh, uh, University in the jazz program. I, I mean, I, I got ensembles and I teach, I mean, and, uh, me and uh, Victor Lewis, the great Victor Lewis drummer, um, teach there. But during the pandemic, um, they were doing Zoom master classes. And Conrad Herwig, the trombone player, he runs the program, he worked a lot. I mean, I know Dagi Jeanette, but Conrad worked with him a lot. And he said, we want to do a Zoom for the school. And so Jack, it goes from his, his I think he's like um, upstate New York. And he's talking about, yeah, you know, I, I'm been, you know, I've been practicing a lot. And, you know, and I'll put on like a Coltrane record and play along to a Coltrane record. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. See, did everybody hear that? Jack Jeanette, you know. It, you know, is, is is 
practicing to cold train records. All right. So I'm like, what do you guys think you should be doing? You know what I mean? But it's like, and, and he didn't say it with any irony or anything. It's just like, that's what you do, man. I'm sitting at home. I'm going to put on a cold train record and find, you know, stuff to play on that. Absolutely. And to me, that's why it's always, you know, he's going to, he's always going forward, man. Absolutely. You know, he's not resting on his laurels. No, no. Absolute monster. Dijonette. Yeah. Just a monster. And that's what music is about. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's growing. It's learning. It's expanding. Forever, forever right. until God says, okay, that's it. And getting your ass kicked. Like every right. time somebody else and going, you know, and going, because that's always, that's been my life is, is I go and fortunate to live in New York, especially when New York was more of a, a hub, you know, you go out, man, you hear somebody you're like, oh my God. And the first thing I want to do, man, not throw away my drumsticks. I want to go down and start practicing. What was that? What was like you're talking about? Right. Exactly. Exactly right. So let's talk a little bit about Robbie Amin, the composer. We got the drummer, but uh, you're in a different place now as now this is your band. This is your record. This is your moment to say, OK, this is how I'm feeling. What, what, what zone do you get into to draw that energy out of you? Well, that that's something that's taken me a long time to do. Like I've, I've co-led bands over the years um and kind of co-reading stuff but until i did my own not like be a co-leader i i man i said i, I gotta write i want to write the music for this record and i didn't it I, you know i i had a lot of doubts hmm. about whether you know so i spent a lot of time and i would write you know with the bass lines and even piano parts and so forth and then i called my boys you know guys that i've been playing with for you know 30 40 years yeah. Um, and I think the first record, if I recall correctly, it was Lincoln Goins. It was um, John Beasley, uh, key pianist, uh, I think with uh, Conrad Herwig. Actually, I got Wayne Kranz played on some of it. But but and I was ready, man, like handing out the music. You know, I'd already sent them MP3s. And I, and I was I was ready, man. I, I would have had if if like play a couple of tunes, say, yeah, man, you know. It's cool, but. Maybe That's John could write something for you. Know what I mean? And I was like, you know, but it was cool. Everybody dug it, but that was a big hurdle for me because I was, you know, you, I thought it was good, like what I wrote. But until I got that kind of, and they were my boys, so they would have told me the truth. You know, they, they were, you know, it's not like I was, you know, like, and and then little by little, I got more. Time. I've written like for all the, the the three solo records, and I've basically written everything, and and I've gotten, you know confident about it um i try to write melodies i believe in melody you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. i usually the last thing i ever thought about was the drum I, I don't think i've ever written one thing that i just came up with a drum groove and that's what the song was based on it was more it could be a bass line or or a melody but the only thing i will say is that i'm i'm very happy with all the records and how they you know and the style it's just but i it's a it's a hard one for me man because i don't sit down and just you know, like I know I got friends that just pianists that just boom, boom, boom. They got like oh, yeah. a stack, you know, and it's a hard pro. And I got to say, it's not a very enjoy. I'll sit down and I'll play for five hours, man. And nope. But writing music, it, you know, I, I don't like the process for me. Gotcha. When it's recorded and done, I'm super happy. I'm proud. I love, you know, but man. Drumming is fun. For me, I haven't gotten to the point where writing music is fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I'm not just honest, man. You know, it's like, you know. But, but your uh, compositions but hit, though. They hit. I got to tell you, your compositions are, you know, they're like spot on. So I, I just was wondering where where that zone was for you. You know, what, what do you have to do to pull that out of you? But it's great to have excellent musicians around you. But right. it was your concept your imagination that brought that melody to the fore in the first place. Yeah. And I, and I do try to like, I mean, literally like write out, write out, come up with bass lines. And even sometimes if it's Latin, like a Montuno that I want to do. And so like, I really try to write, you know, and then let them do what they, you know, I mean, do what they do. It's not like I wrote and I want to, oh, it's gotta be like that. You know what I mean? No, no, no. But, 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 um, but yeah, I, I try to look at it as the whole, like, I, I don't try to just write, like sketch out like a bebop head 
Gotcha. You know what I mean? It's more like I really try to come up with the whole, well, what's the baseline going to be? Or what's, you know what I mean? Like have a whole thing in my head, try to put it down and then see what happens with it. Yeah. I understand. I understand that. Well, let's talk about Rob, you mean the author, because you and Lincoln wrote that book. Uh, funkifying, funk, funkifying, if I could say. Hey, it. I could tell you, what, I could tell you another way to call. It. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. you know like, I, I don't even have to correct. I'm, like, I'm not going to correct you. Go ahead, man. <laughs> We're going to keep it on the one, no, but anyway. Tell me about the process, though, of, of, of bringing that to bear. I mean, what was the impetus for writing the book in the first place? Is this just uh, from an education standpoint or, you know, drummers like me? Did you want me to, you know, just get it and, and, and go along with it? What was that, that impetus? That, that really came about when when i was going back to lincoln goins and i would we'd be working out in my five floor walk up and you came up with all this stuff uh because lincoln was playing a lot like a percussionist on the because i was talking about how i was incorporating africa you know like salsa you know timbales congas bongo on the drum set and lincoln was also involved with like you know playing tumbaos but also slapping and just doing stuff um which was why when we did that first record with the first record I recorded with Dave Valentine, it was the first record he did where he didn't have percussion. Now I spent my life playing with percussion. When I played with Ruben Blaze, man, it's three percussionists and drums, which yeah. is a lot. But with that record, because he was hearing like the whole rhythm section just with the bass and drums, so we had no, we would never have thought of doing a instructional video. We well, have the video later, but but that was um, Drummers Collective. Um, that was that was like late 80s, uh, I guess it was 90, uh, when they were the pioneers of the, the drum, uh, you know, they, they, the first one they did, well, the first one they did actually was Gad, a video of Gad wow. with Richard T. Then they did a Yogi Horton one. Oh, then man, they did I didn't Wax see that one. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that one you can find on, on YouTube. And then they did, uh, Weckl did one, Dennis Chambers did. So, they approached us actually and said, would you guys, what do you think about doing a bass and drums? You know, and we decided, well, if we do that, if it's gonna be Latin, we gotta do it as a music minus one. Got because it. you need the band. You know, it's not just learning a pattern and you know what I'm saying? And that was this other thing, it has to be bass and drums because to play, to get the right vibe for the music, the relationship between the bass and drums in all music, but especially in Afro-Cuban music, it's very connected. You're not doubling each other. Gotcha. But if bass is playing like a like a samba type thing or whatever, the drummer's playing tumba, it's not gonna work. Or vice versa. Like the bass play tum you know, and the drummer's going to not gonna work either. So that was the idea of having like bass and drums together. So we did, we did it like, we recorded, man. I think we did it like in a day, a day or two, you know, um, we had Mike Stern played on it. Uh, I know Bill O'Connell. Um, the first, and then we had no idea it was gonna, the, the, the hard part was transcribing all the stuff, man. That was a pain in the, you know what, you know, right? Trans, you know. But then, and then it ended up doing like really well. Like I, I got friends in Cuba that had, that was the biggest, you know, honor, you know, of all, like compliment when I'd be going to Cuba to play and guys said, hey, man, can you sign my, your book? And I'm like, Cuba? What? Uh -huh. Really? You know? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Man, that's beautiful. <laughs> Do you know the musician uh, Barry Miles uh, in New York? Oh, yeah. Pianist. Him and his brother. But he started as a drummer. But uh, he he uh, he said he had went as far as the drums could take him, which is why he switched to piano, believing piano uh, to be a percussion instrument. And that's when he really started composing. And uh, so he he felt the drums were too limiting. Uh, do you play piano as well when you compose? Just enough, to, just enough to compose. I mean, I I mean, I can't do a gig on piano, but when I compose, I compose at the piano. I see. OK, now yes, what was your. Yeah. 
What's your, is a percussion instrument, piano for you or what? What's that? Is the piano a percussion instrument for you? No, I mean, I actually, I, I, I use it like that's, if I'm going to write, like I, I just, I'll sit at the piano, work out a melody, work out a bass line, work out, you know what I'm saying? But that's, that's like, that's the, that's the starting point. Gotcha. Um, I'll go like, I'll go from the piano and then I'll have sketched out most of the parts and then I'll mess around like when, you know, garage band or whatever. And, and, gotcha. and put the, you know, but, but it's the piano. I'm not playing like a, I mean, thank God for, for, cause I'll, I'll come up yeah. with complicated stuff yeah, and then I'll right. into it real slowly, you know, and just, <laughs> right. But I'm not a good enough piano player to play anything that I write. You know what I mean? I can dig it. I you can dig saying? it. Are you are you incorporating any electronics in your kit at all? Um, no. I mean, I to be honest, there was a time I remember when Simmons drums, you know, yeah, the, the, sure. the and and I think for there was one Ruben Blades tour where I had like one Simmons, you know, like a snare, you know, and then uh Many, many years ago, this is like in the 80s, I, I, the first time I went to Japan, it was with a hip hop singer, uh, Sapphire. Cause you know, the hip hop thing really started in the Bronx with the Puerto Ricans. And I had like a um, <clears throat> a Roland like eight pad thing incorporated on the kit. Cause it was playing that Roland 80, you know, 808. But I never did. And I'll tell you what I am into now though. Since I have like a kind of home studio, now I'm into, putting effects on the drums okay because the, the truth of the matter is man and it took me a long time to realize this i mean i've had the, the the honor of working with some of the greatest engineers on the planet and some of the best studios on the planet sure and the idea is you get that drum sound and you capture your drum sound great you capture that on tape not tape anymore but now i'm realizing man it's everybody else has all the fun, man, with the reverb, with the gates, with all that. So that's what I'm doing now. And I'm wow. saying, man, where, where have I been all these years? You know, because it's always so far you can go. And just I understand best mics, best app, just make it like a classical, great classical recording. But now I'm like, uh -uh, this is too much fun to be able to put <laughs> you know, effects and all that. So that's what I'm going to do in my next record. I mean, I don't, I'm not telling, going all crazy sure. and making a, you know what I mean? But just, oh yeah. Yeah. You know, but now let, let me ask with those engineers, how much drum replacement was done like in post? Did they ever have to, you know, did you ever play with any triggers on your kit while recording so that they can get that fuller kick or Tom that they were looking for? Not so much, actually. No, I, I think almost most of the, I mean, who knows? I don't know. I mean, some records people might've like, you know, sample triggered stuff but most of the records i've done have been pretty much what you see is what you get you know what i mean like you know i've been fortunate like to you know i i kind of know how to get that's that's another thing we talk about the studio work i mean just to know how to get a, a really good sound in the room you're and to tune the drums the right way and and just have a, a really good like i mean i'm doing this stuff down here man i, I only i'm using four mics and i'm getting yeah. by with it like people right. like engineers are telling me like I, there's one record i did with you know we did a knee board state-of-the-art studio and i did one track on my own here and the engineer was like i was waiting for him to say yo man get serious man you had like 12 tracks and you're gonna hand me this force and he said you know the thing you did down there sounds maybe a little better than <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you know. And once you know but your room cool. and you know your mic right. man it's, it's done wow yeah, Absolutely. exactly. But so I would, he, I would say, I would, I would lean more in the direction of effects on top of the drums, understood. as opposed to actually mixing electronic drums with. And I think the industry's gone back that way mm -hmm. in terms of live playing. You know what I mean? Yeah. For a while, everybody had like you know sample stuff, and and you know, I mean that's because the music's actually. I mean, most music now doesn't even use real drums. I mean, when they record that's it, true. They that's true. That's true. Road, you know, but yeah. That's absolutely true. So so here's what we did. I did put it out on LinkedIn and Facebook that I would be having a conversation with you. And so I said, if you have a question, what's your question? OK, so Lawrence Payne from LinkedIn has this question for you. Jerry, I have a question. As musicians, we tend to think in terms of beat, rhythm and the pocket. 
Then in the context of recording, we have to follow tempo. Follow only the tempo as in a, metro, a metronome click or beep. And it becomes easy to lose the beat because the note events rarely occur that precisely. Which is wrong, the tempo or the beat? Yeah, so, so he's saying tempo, he's saying about the fact that most music is recorded with a metronome now. Yeah. But I couldn't quite understand that. What, what was he actually saying? Yeah, he was, he was saying, and I, I'm, I'm just trying to read it just like he uh, put it, it becomes easy to lose the beat uh, if a metronome click or a beep was happening because the note events rarely occur that precisely, I guess he's saying, as the music is going on. So what should he follow? The temp? Well, I would say, I've, I'm st I mean, I mean, one obvious thing, if if you if you're losing the beat, one the the easiest solution to that is to have a different sound on the downbeat, for example. Yeah. yeah. You know, keep yeah. go go keep go go. You know what I'm saying? I think that when I practice, I probably spend half the time practicing with the metronome and half the time without it. Gotcha. You know. When I came up, click tracks were something relatively new, like when I first did, and I, I wasn't used to it. I, I, it, it took me a long time to, and it was Francisco Santana was the bass player. He said, "Man, the click track is your friend. Mm -hmm. Don't think of it because I was nervous with it. I was like, man, I got to bury that, and then, it, and it would affect how I would play because I'm thinking too much about it, and I think that." The pendulum has swung the other direction now. I think that now musicians, almost every mu music that's recorded, even including some jazz now, is done to a click. And I think that people are very adept at playing with the click. But when the click isn't there, then, the because I think they've gotten too used to playing with a click, whereas, say, my generation playing with a click was something new, you know, and it took time to get used to it. Um, I mean, there are guys that are really masterful with it, you know, like guys like J.R. Robinson, which everything was done. And they would know how to play behind it a little or ahead. I mean, when I play with the click, generally, I guess it's I'm trying to just not hear it in the sense that I'm on it so that you're not hearing slam right. stuff. But, you know. But you also want to have momentum, you know, sometimes a fill might, you know, like one of the things Gad would always do that made things so is that he wouldn't push on his fill. If anything, he laid back, you know, going, you know, so, but I think that in terms of that, <clears throat> to answer the person's question, I would say, don't always practice to a metronome, but also practice with a metronome. If you're having trouble losing the beat, Make it easier for yourself, you know, put it, put it. And the other thing is be creative. The best thing the metronome to do with a metronome is be creative with it. Mm -hmm. In other words, make your metronome, but don't make those quarter notes. Make that say the end of two, one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, right? So you're not so locked into always hearing a down, a quarter note, and you can even get deeper with it. You can make, but you're, those are dotted quarters. Ah, 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 ah. You see what I'm saying? So now the metronome is its just a percussionist playing with you, playing like a different, you know. So those are things I would say to do with the, like if you're having trouble losing the beat, or if that's sort of what he was saying, you know. Yeah, that's real cool, man. Well, I thank you, thank you, thank you, Brother Robbie, for your generosity on the time. I appreciate it. The pleasure, you. man. And uh, the next time we have to talk about modern music, okay? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. We try to get into a little bit. But no, and, it's, and, and yeah, so yeah. thank you very much, man, for for, for, for having me and, and, and all the listeners out there, you know. And, and uh, you know, hopefully I can be of some help, you know. And, and uh, I mean, there's so much information now. The last thing I would say is that if you're taking advantage of all the information that's out there, that's great. But be patient. Don't click off after one minute or two minutes. Wow. You know, that's, you know, 
you know, if this is a seven minute tune, listen from beginning to end, because that's, that's the only right. way you're really going to learn. You know, so, that is you wise. Know? That's absolutely <clears throat> wise advice. Short attention spans, too, it seems like. Uh, okay. All right. I won't, I won't go down that path. That's but... the next thing. <laughs> Peace, right. and, peace and blessings to you. You and too, man. that multi-Grammy award winner, co-author, I'm telling you, great, great guy, Robbie Amin, excellent drummer. Check him out at RobbieAminMusic.com. You'll get the things that you missed here, and you'll see how come he is one of my favorite drummers. My name is Jerry B. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to like subscribe and share this video. You tell 10 people you know, and you tell 14 people you don't know that you get down with the Entree Musician. Because as you know, I am the Entree Musician, but the most important thing is so are you. We will definitely see you next time. God bless. <laughs>